uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. I'm slightly overawed by the art. Um, and my first uh, remark um, wouldn't really apply to this building, really, but that is to say um, that uh, rather recently, uh, two subjects have suddenly entered the mainstream of uh, journalism, commentary, and so on. And the two subjects are enlightenment values and Islam, not things that, uh, that more than 10 years ago uh, were very widely discussed in the popular press. Now most pundits um, are experts on, on both uh, accounts. Um, the first question to ask, I, so, I suppose, when people talk about enlightenment values and uh, the enlightenment, Western civilization, and so on, is to ask what they mean by that, uh, which is by no means clear, because obviously the, the Enlightenment was not just one thing, uh, nor can Enlightenment values be uh, put in a few words. Um, it has many strands uh, and many figures uh, behind it. Uh, there's Volca Voltaire on the one hand, but a man not often mentioned by people who use uh, the term Enlightenment values as something that has to be defended against its challenges uh, in our time, um, the Marquis de Sade is not very often mentioned, um, but he was just as much uh, a man of the Enlightenment as Voltaire. In fact, uh, he's the one who really took the, the logic of Enlightenment thought to its extreme. That is to say, if uh, there is no God to tell us what is uh, good and bad, um, then uh, it's up to man to follow uh, his instincts. And um, so he takes you... Um, in places that without the Enlightenment um, we'd never have gone. Um, I think, though, that uh, the Enlightenment, Enlightenment values, and so on, are really used as shorthand uh, by commentators um, who warn us of Islam, of course, in particular. Uh, it's sort of shorthand for our civilization, our culture. Um, the same people, uh, I would argue, 50, 60 years ago, probably would have spoken of Christendom. Uh, but this is not a popular notion anymore, or not sufficiently popular, at least in Europe, uh, to be of much polemical use, uh, even though there are um, uh, people who talk about uh, Judeo-Christian values uh, as though the Jews and the Christians were always great brothers in arms in building our joint Western civilization. Um, but this is somewhat rarer, I think, than the idea of the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment being challenged by uh, Islamic intolerance, uh, Islamic values. Um, and as I said, I think it's shorthand. I think it's a kind of badge for our culture, which is somewhat ironic because, of course, one of the um, marks of Enlightenment thinking um, is that it uh, was supposed that reason is a universal thing, that it, 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 it implies universality. And one of the fruits of the Enlightenment was indeed translation, uh, interest in other cultures, and so on. And th the idea that it was there to defend our culture against others was certainly not particularly congenial to most thinkers uh, at the time of the en Enlightenment. Um, but there it is. Um, people warn of uh, Islamism, uh, Islamization of Europe, uh, Eurabia, Islamofascism, uh, and the fact that we now live in 1938, and that uh, if we don't stand up to the challenges of Western civilization and quote-unquote enlightenment values, soon uh, the new fascism will engulf us all. Um, I think there are the, the reason why this debate has become so um, divided and, and, and polemicized and therefore s somewhat toxic, because it's, very d it's easy to debate and fruitful to debate if both sides who have different views but are both genuinely interesting, interested in finding uh, the truth. But um, when it becomes a question of uh, denunciation, and if it's truly 1938, uh, then it's a question of sorting out friends and enemies, and it can no longer really be a proper debate. Now, I think there are three problems, three challenges, if you like, to... Um, uh, let us call it enlightenment values or liberalism um, in our uh, democracies, not just Western democracies. After all, there have been um, bombings in Indonesia uh, as well, which is sometimes forgotten. And I'll, I'll, I'll outline the three. One is uh, the problem that arises from uh, immigration anywhere, especially when the immigration is, is fairly large in scale and many people in a short uh, 
short time move into um, uh, old uh, areas, um, and, there are high, and there's relatively high unemployment, and there are social tensions. Um, the problem that, uh, that almost invariably arises uh, is uh, that of crime. You see this in the history of the United States, that the waves of immigration always produce new uh, crime figures, new forms of organized crime, and so on. It's one way for immigrants, of course, to uh, organize themselves, but, in the, but it's, it's also a result of the dislocations that come with, with large-scale immigration. Um, petty crime, uh, organized crime, and so on. This is one problem. The second problem um, is uh, perhaps a more cultural one, um, and that, of, that people loosely term as values, um, which uh, comes from the fact that you have people who come from rural uh, areas in Morocco or Turkey or Bangladesh. They move to Western cities, and their views on such things as the relations between men and women or homosexuality do not uh, accord with the mainstream um, in uh, modern Western liberal democracy. So that there, are, there is that problem, and that leads to issues such as whether uh, veils should or should not be worn in public schools in France and, and, and so on. The third problem, which I would say is the, mo the, the most serious, is that of violent revolutionary uh, Islam. Um, Islam as, a, as an extremist political ideology uh, which has produced the kind of violence um, that we all know about. Um, and uh, this is a problem. Now, the reason why the debate has become so difficult is that many people, especially those who warn us that we're in 1938 and that we're faced with Islamo-fascism, uh, is that people, those people tend to conflate these three problems and, pr and pr present them um, as though they're exactly the same, that there is a kind of monolithic problem um, which can be um, uh, summarized uh, by simply calling it Islam or Islamism or Islamization, as though all these different tensions and problems and threats are exact, have exactly the same source. As one well-known um, activist uh, put it in an interview when uh, she was uh, asked, so you think we're at, at war with Islam? And uh, she said, yes, we are at war with Islam. But don't you mean Islamist extremism? No, no, we are at war with Islam. So this is uh, a view that is there, which, as I say, conflates these um, different problems. Now, when you do that, when you say we're at war with Islam, then uh, there is no option but to divide people into friends and enemies. And I think it's, it's become particularly fraught um, because uh, history being history, especially in Europe, um, when it comes to matters of racial tension, prejudice, intolerance, and so on, um, most Europeans still tend to see this from the or through the perspective of uh, the history of World War II. And of course, different European countries have different histories, and so we'll use different metaphors. Um, but uh, in, in my native country, in the Netherlands, people still tend to see uh, these kind of issues when they become moral issues um, in, ten, in, in, the term, in terms of World War II, who was, in, in, as, as they say in Dutch, good uh, or wrong. Wrong meaning you collaborated with the Nazi occupation, good meaning you were in the resistance. Of course, in, 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 in fact, most people were neither. Most people tried to uh, keep their noses clean and survive as best they could. Um, but it, it has become a kind of a moral litmus test for debates on um, immigration, uh, race, and so on, ever since the war. And this particular debate uh, on Islam certainly has become that. In France, it's probably sl somewhat different. I think the, Catholic, the history of the Catholic Church, of the French Revolution, of the tensions since the French Revolution between the Catholic, the reactionary Catholic monarchist sometimes um, opposition to uh, what was achieved in the French Revolution um, and the, 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 the believers in the French Republic still um, haunt discussions on religion and uh, community, race, and so on to this day. So behind every uh, headscarf, there is somewhere a, a, the specter of a, of a priest with his flapping black robes. And um, also, I, I would say, I th in, and I think in France it's become particularly um, 
nasty, the debate, because it also tends to be seen in, in Dreyfusard and anti-Dreyfusard terms. Now, when it comes to that, if it's, if it's whether, whether you're pro-Dreyfus or anti-Dreyfus, whether you're a reactionary anti-Semite or uh, a believer in the republic and in equality and individualism and so on, there is indeed very ri little space for debate, because then uh, if, it's, if you cast it in those terms, it, then uh, in fact, uh, you have to stand up and be counted, and there is no, there's, you can't be wishy-washy um, about these things. And uh, I think that's exactly what has happened, that, that uh, in this the debate on the Enlightenment, the challenge to the Enlightenment, the, the, the challenges of Islam in Europe, it has become more and more this um, question of, are you a friend or are you an enemy? Are you a collaborator or are you a resistor and so on, which I think is deeply regrettable. And um, it puts to mind um, a, a, a particular definition of a, of a kind of politics um, written about by my friend and co-author uh, of a book called Occidentalism, the Israeli philosopher uh, Avishai Margalit, who in his um, last book, uh, called, um, also published by Princeton University Press, called Compromises and Rotten Compromises, distinguishes what he calls economic politics from religious, uh, religious politics. Economic politics are about interests, about um, material interests, class interests, and so on, and these are things that one can uh, negotiate, you can compromise, uh, you can do deals. Religious politics, which are not necessarily the, the politics of a particular, of a given faith, but are the politics of, of the sacred, of a higher cause, of an absolute principle, of absolute truth, um, for which people are prepared to die, uh, sacrifice, but also prepared to kill. Um, and when that kind of politics, and a, a certain amount of that is probably needed in, in any society. You can't simply have politics based on material interests. There is so, some form of idealism is necessary. But those kind of politics um, are problematic because they make it impossible to compromise. If, if you compromise, you compromise your, prin your absolute principle, and then it gets, uh, you, you become, as it were, uh, a, a traitor. Now, liberals have always been the traditional enemy of those who um, engage in religious politics. And religious politics can be left, they can be right, they can have all kinds of stripes. I mean, the um, Stalinists of the 1930s and, and, and 40s were in, in, engaged in a kind of religious politics. But so were the uh, right-wing nationalists uh, in Germany between the two world wars. And, and, and so, indeed, uh, were the Nazis. And liberals have always been uh, attacked by um, people of that kind of persuasion or that particular political attitude for being for not believing in anything for not for being bourgeois uh, addicted to comfort uh, not believing in any higher cause never prepared to sacrifice themselves for anything uh, 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 by definition unheroic and uh, and therefore to be despised and I think we we see we this language again emerging um, among those who accuse liberals for being relativists, um, who, uh, who don't stand up for Western civilization, the Enlightenment, and so on, against uh, the challenge to it. Um, in my view, of course, liberals do believe in something. They believe in freedom, in, in, in uh, freedom of speech, uh, individual freedom, and so on and so forth, and are prepared to defend it. But it is true that liberalism, by by, by its nature, does not have a heroic uh, narrative. And I think heroic narratives are inherently um, dangerous in, in, uh, in liberal democracies. Um, and liberals have to answer, I think, this uh, attack, this accusation of not having values, not believing enough in any values to defend them against people who would uh, destroy them. Now, the problem, I think, with insisting on common values in saying that we cannot uh, maintain liberal democracy without people having common values is that we now live in societies uh, which are, uh, whether we like it or not, and it was probably always the case uh, in almost every country, but now very visibly and dramatically so, we live in societies that are multi-ethnic and multicultural. 
That's not to say that one has to believe in multiculturalism as a kind of dogma um, in the way that it, people did sometimes in the 70s and 80s, the idea that um, uh, promoting integration of minorities somehow as a form of neocolonialism and that minority cultures, especially non-Western cultures, are, are somehow superior to Western culture and that the Enlightenment, the idea that the Enlightenment would stand for anything universal, again, is a form of Western arrogance and imperialism, and therefore people should be uh, encouraged to stick to their own cultures, whether it makes integration um, difficult uh, or not. I, don't, I, I would not subscribe to that, and I think that kind of multiculturalism, even in, in Britain and, and the Netherlands, two countries where um, that was particularly strong, I don't think that that idea is very strong anymore. But we do live in societies um, whose citizens uh, do uh, have often different cultural values, traditions, customs, and, and so on. And to insist that this is a bad thing and to insist that somehow common values have to be imposed uh, by the state, um, I think uh, is, 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 is difficult, uh, if not illiberal, um, and uh, probably doomed to failure. Um, it may be better for Europeans to get used to, uh, or this is one thing perhaps we can learn from uh, the United States, uh, there are other things which we're better off not learning, but one thing we might learn from the United States is, is, is that there is a, a definition of national identity, if you like, which is based on uh, citizenship, on a political idea. That you, the, the reason why it's easy to be so-called so hyphenated in America, an Irish American or an Italian American or a Vietnamese American, is because it's very clear what it is to be an American. It means that you're loyal to the Constitution, that you abide by the rules of democracy, uh, and so on. And uh, what you do in private, your own culture, your habits, your customs, your, your, and, and so on, are, are not really the business of the state. Nothing is imposed on people as long as they do um, abide by that political uh, sense of citizenship. And I think this is something we need to get used to in Europe uh, as well. It, it's probably, it'll be difficult and it, it, it'll be a, a long drawn out process because national identity in Europe, even in France, I would argue, and of course the French Republican model is the closest we have to probably to the uh, American one. I mean, they're the two democracies to come out of revolutions. Um, both uh, republics believe that they that stand for universal values, which is, of course, why they often clash, because it's difficult to have two claimants to universal values. Um, but even France, I would say, um, still underneath all the republican rhetoric, have a a, 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 a cultural and historical view of themselves as being French. The mission civilisatrice, which the French uh, believed in in their uh, colonial enterprises, for example, in other words, that it was a good thing to turn Africans and Algerians and so on into, uh, into Frenchmen by teaching them uh, the beauties of uh, Voltaire and Racine and, uh, uh, and, and uh, everything that was associated with being a civilized Frenchman. Um, points to the fact that, it's, that to be French is not just to be a citoyen. It's not just a question of being a Republican citizen. There is something much more cultural about it, which uh, is, is not easy to acquire. Even more difficult, I think, um, is the uh, notion of being part of a nation that I think is still very strong in Europe, in all European countries, that it's a little bit like being a member of, of, of a club with its unspoken rules and codes of, of, of behavior and dress, which are not necessarily uh, laid down in the law, but everybody kind of understands. Um, and uh, you snigger about people um, who don't wear the right shoes or the right tie and, and, and so on, but, and, but you don't necessarily cosh them over the head, but it, it does make it very difficult for outsiders to be a member of that club. And of course, traditionally, minorities have often um, have become members of that club and very demonstrably become members of the club, even over demonstrably become members of the club. The, 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 the idea of the immigrant with the club tie where the f colors are just a little bit too flashy and, 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 and so on. Um, but it's difficult, I think. And uh, that's why it, it'll take more time for uh, minorities and especially uh, minorities from non-Western countries to 
adapt, but adapt I think they will. And, and perhaps rather than speaking of, and this is where I'll finish, rather than speaking of universal values that we somehow need in order to keep our uh, civilization going, rather than having a common religion, which is certainly a lost cause, or common values that are su supposedly universal, we can simply uh, perhaps s strip it down a little and demand that people um, abide by the common laws. And I would quote uh, a, a writer about um, Islam in general and Islam in Europe in particular, uh, I think one of the the most acute observers and certainly one of the coolest heads um, in, at a time that very few people uh, have kept their heads, um, Olivier Roy. And he's said somewhere in one of his books, um, we don't need to insist on common values. We need to insist that everybody plays by uh, the rules, the rules of democracy, the rules of the law. Now, of course, that produces uh, different problems. It's never quite so simple, and we can perhaps discuss that uh, in a minute. After all, laws too uh, uh, reflect certain cultural traditions and, uh, and so on. They're not entirely uh, abstract. But I think it's a beginning. And that's why when people say, how do you, uh, you, you talk about, if, you, if they challenge a liberal by saying, you know, you talk about tolerance and that's all very well, but how do you tolerate the intolerant? Well, I think you can tolerate the intolerant. We always have. I mean, there are intolerant people and intolerant views in every society. Where what you can't tolerate is when intolerant views are imposed by violence, when people either threaten violence or use violence to impose them, and in effect break the law. That's where you, uh, I think, draw the line, and you insist that uh, all citizens uh, abide by the law. Uh, I don't also think, by the way, it's a good thing that to insist that everybody learns the language, and um, it's never a bad thing that certain common values are instilled in education and so on, but I don't think the state can impose uh, common values. I don't think it should insist on assimilation. It can, ins it can insist on integration to the extent that people abide by the law, speak the language, and have the maximum economic chances um, in the societies in which they're born, um, wherever they come from. Uh, and I think that is something that even liberals can agree that is worth fighting for and possibly sacrificing for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could, I'll just ask a couple of questions, then we'll, we'll open up and, and finish at um, around 7. Um, when you kind of confront uh, in, enlightenment zealotry, as it might be termed, uh, is your kind of starting point that this is a misunderstanding and a misreading of the Enlightenment uh, uh, itself? Well, yes, because the Enlightenment, one reading of the Enlightenment um, by people who, who do use it as a, a, a badge of zealotry is that it's um, it is the Voltairean notion of écraser l'infâme, that, that, that religion per se has to be crushed. Of course, what Voltaire did think that, I mean, uh, he, he was democratic in the sense that he was just as anti-Jewish as he was anti-Christian. But um, uh, this was really a, a, a political issue, especially in, in France at the time of an absolute monarchy where the Catholic Church um, had enormous power. But I don't, by no means all um, thinkers of the Enlightenment thought that the infam had to be écrasé. Um, uh, there were um, uh, Locke, I believe, was, was, after all, a devout Christian. Uh, the only people he was intolerant of were the atheists. And um, so uh, religion is not incom necessarily incompatible with uh, Enlightenment thinking. Of course, there are also those who argue that the real Enlightenment is not the Enlightenment of Locke, which is already compromised, but is the sort of radical Enlightenment of Spinoza and Bayel. But Spinoza, too, did not believe that... Um, religion had to be eradicated or um, that it would go away. Uh, he, he, he believed it should make people behave better. And as long um, as uh, religious authority didn't interfere with secular authority or secular or, or rational inquiry, science, um, it had a place. And so I think some people are uh, somewhat zealous and um, partly out of anti-clericalism, 
partly because, uh, well, I mean, one phenomenon uh, that we see now is, I, I, we don't need to go into names, but I mean, it, it, it's a well-known phenomenon. Some people who were on the far left for in, the, in the 60s, 70s, 80s have now suddenly joined cultural conservatives in defending our civilization, the Enlightenment, and so on against uh, the supposed threat of Islam. And one of the reasons, again, is they already were, of course, uh, steeped in anti-clericalism, but that there, w there was an element of zealotry already there, which is simply transferred to, uh, I mean, the cause has shifted, the zealotry has not. So I think it's not so much that there is such a thing as enlightenment fundamentalism. It's a phrase that's sometimes uh, attributed to me. I, 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 I certainly didn't invent it. Um, <laughs> but I think the enlightenment is you. Any, any good idea, uh, when used with uh, sufficient uh, dogmatism, uh, becomes a bad idea. Can we explore um, the kind of psychological construct of the sacred in the sense that um, at the heart of religious belief is a notion of the sacred, an unapologetic notion of the sacred, but yet um, those of us who are not of faith uh, possibly would reject the idea that we too hold sacred beliefs, but yet, of course, we do. If we take, for example, if, if, we, if we describe sacred beliefs as those things which were we asked to give them up, were we offered money to give them up, we'd be likely to adhere to them even more strongly. So they don't conform to the normal kind of instrumental or relativist values that we would apply to other, uh, other goods. Uh, that human rights, for example, is, uh, has become sacred for, for liberals, even though human rights have only existed as a concept for a tiny fraction of civilized man's existence. Is the, is the kind of upsurge of commitment to the Enlightenment, is this a kind of new sacredness, a liberal sacredness? It's a kind of set of values which can be adhered to by liberals with a kind of depth that, uh, that religious people adhere to uh, the tenets of their faith. And is there equivalence, do you think, between those kind of that secular and religious notion of the sacred? Well, I do think that people who believe um, that uh, their idea of human rights or their idea of the Enlightenment are... Uh, universal and therefore have to be promoted all over the world and, and even perhaps um, uh, imposed by using military force, that they are really the heirs of the old missionary tradition. There's no question about that. And I, and I do think that human rights, uh, just as in Freudianism, uh, uh, psychology became a kind of secularized version for many secular Jewish intellectuals of a religion they'd abandoned. I think that uh, human rights um, have, uh, um, uh, and what some people, some people refer to as Enlightenment values, has taken on that uh, slightly sacred notion. Um, so my answer to that is yes, but I, I don't think we can get rid of a notion of the sacred, nor do I think it's necessarily desirable and I think when you, we, we know from history the res what happens when people violently try and get rid of it, uh, as in communism, for example. The, sacred sim the sense of the sacred and, and, and the desire for worship simply gets transferred to great dictators, for example, or people waving their little red books uh, to Mao and people getting arrested and sometimes killed for um, stepping on a newspaper with a picture of Chairman Mao which showed... Uh, which was, you know, almost like stepping on an image of the Virgin Mary in, in, in the times of the, um, uh, in, in earlier times. So, uh, th th hence the title of my book, Taming the Gods, because I don't think you can get rid of it. I agree with Spinoza. I think you have to contain institutionally and, and, and culturally the violent and irrational impulses to which it can lead um, uh, in its secular and its... Uh, organized religious form. And, and what do you think of the um, efforts of people like Karen Armstrong working in the kind of domain of interfaith work, which, is, which seeks to establish uh, common beliefs at the heart of all faiths, and particularly the golden rule? Does this seem to you to be a kind of... I mean, it, would this in some ways fall foul of your concerns about the attempt to suggest that there are universal values? Because she would argue the golden rule can be found in all religions. Or... Or is it instead to find, uh, to, to, to see that there is a congruence between what lies at the heart of religious belief uh, 
and uh, Enlightenment values? Well, I mean, she's an ex-nun, and of course, like an ex-Trotskyist, you never quite get rid of it. <laughs> um, uh, it's difficult if you haven't been r raised in any kind of religion to sort of become a great believer in cross-faith dialogue and so on and so forth. I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with cross-faith di faith dialogue. The, the problem is with, dogma with, with dogmatism, ideological dogmatism, which doesn't brook contradiction or, or, or compromise. And um, if you can solve that problem through dialogue, fine, but usually you can't, because people who, who are that wedded to an ideology or a dogma, whether it's religious or secular, are not open to argument. These, these are not people who go to conferences and talk to nice uh, fellow believe, other believers and, um, and sort of come to some wishy-washy notion that we all share the same. I mean, this doesn't work if you're in Al-Qaeda or or talking to somebody who is a follower of Al-Qaeda, or, or indeed, a, in, in the past, a Stalinist. Um, so sweet reason doesn't always work. Uh, that would be my answer to the well-meant um, uh, notions of finding sort of common ground. Where, where people agree to that there is common ground, there are, those people are already sort of okay. It, it's the people who, by, who, who don't agree. And can I just finally, before I open it up, um, go to the, the, the final points that you were making, and I know this is a simplistic interpretation, which is in a way why I asked the question for you to clarify, that you almost seem to be arguing that what we should focus on is people's actions rather than their thoughts, uh, and we should be concerned if their actions break the law, but we shouldn't be concerned with uh, their private thoughts and values. But of course, actions are legitimized by thoughts and legitimized by culture. And so we might have a debate, for example, we do have debates about the effect on young people of listening to hip-hop music, which seems to portray a certain attitude to women or to violence or to materialism. Uh, and that would be a legitimate debate about whether that culture does in ways indeed sanction actions, which then would become criminal, we would act against those. Isn't it therefore similarly reasonable to have a debate about what it might be within uh, a culture, within a, um, an interpretation of a religion which sanctions sets of actions which society objects to, whether that's terrorism or, um, or various forms of, uh, of kind of refusal to participate in, this, in, 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 in yes. public life. No, I think it's always good to have debate and, 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 and critical debate and, and, and uh, well, what you're really asking me is, is, is sort of a, uh, using uh, the Quran as a justification for honor killings, for killing infidels and so on. Now, I think First of all, I think that every, every religion can lend itself as a justification for violent behavior. I mean, even Buddhism in, in Sri Lanka, you see this. Most so-called sacred texts, if you interpret it in certain ways, can be read as, uh, as aggressive. Uh, the the, the, the non-politically correct Passover... Uh, the Jewish Passover has passages uh, that are pretty bloodthirsty uh, as well. But um, if your question is, should we, is it legitimate to debate these things, be critical, take a critical attitude, absolutely. Would it be a good thing to censor these uh, expressions? Uh, there I'm, I veer towards uh, the American um, adherence to the First Amendment. I, the First Amendment allows far more free, free speech than our European laws do because in every European country there are laws against um, insulting people on the grounds of uh, race and creed, and, uh, which in the U.S. does not exist. But what the limit in the U.S., and of course it's not, never simple because different Supreme Courts have been endlessly debating and interpreting um, uh, the First Amendment, but the limits there are if you can prove that there is imminent and real danger in an expression, um, then uh, it's unconstitutional and, and, and you, you can arrest somebody for, for, for that. If, you can't, if there is no question of imminent uh, danger, people can say pretty much anything they like. And I have a certain sympathy with that. I don't like the idea of having laws that um, forbid... Uh, say, Holocaust denial, or, um, or even, um, you know, 
various kinds of bigoted expression. I mean, I think people should be allowed to say and think what they want, um, but not if, it's, if you can show that it actually does, uh, will lead to, uh, to violence. Now, that's also easier said than done, because how do you um, decide uh, when uh, imminent danger is there? And that you can only really discuss on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, there is no golden rule for that. 